Um, so look, it's so lovely to see you all. This is a quite an emotional tasting for me because I was going through earlier on today uh, through some photographs of um, back in the day when we started. And it feels like a time, Man's brought some uh, kitchen paper. Just I imagine she start thinks crying. I'm going to start gesturing and spilling wine. I'm crying. crying. Okay, I might start crying. Okay. <laughs> but yes, the, I really wanted to tell the story a little bit about what it was all like when we started. Um, we have my lovely friends Giles and Philippe on the call. Yes. Do you want to wave, Giles? Hi. Um, who joined us very early in on, on this journey, and I hope you will tell us a little bit about um, how they got involved. Um, and we've got the chance to taste these wines that we really don't have the chance to taste anymore. There's two vintages uh, pretty much entirely out of stock. The others have got um, 12 or 18 bottles left. Um, we have one wine that's got 100 and something bottles left of this range. Uh, otherwise, it's, this is it. Um, and we're about to launch our, um, what will actually be our 12th different, different vintage, 2019. So there will be, sometime shortly after this, when we've launched and shipped our 2019, a, a chance to taste the next six vintages, which I, I hope many of you who started a, this early part of the journey will be keen to, to try and see how the wines have evolved from there. Um, so what I'm proposing to do is, uh, first of all, if, if you have six glasses for each wine, probably a good idea to pour them. Um, these definitely benefit from a little, uh, a little aeration, even, even the older ones, which possibly um, are reaching their peak, if not perhaps going down the other side. So do pour them. And what I'm gonna do is really talk through a few uh, uh, of the early days, tell you a little bit about the story, show you a few pictures, and then we'll come to the first wine until 20, 15, 20 minutes in. If you want in the meantime, just have a little sip of each one and jot some notes down, that's absolutely fine. Um, just don't finish them. So that when we come to that wine uh, that we're all talking about, then um, you have, you've got a little bit left in the bottle. So how does that sound? I'm just going to go and find uh, a few photographs that I had a look at earlier on. And it's worth pointing out that um, we only got a digital camera in 2005, I think it was. So, and, and even then we weren't using it very, um, very extensively. So a lot of the pictures that I've actually been to our actual physical printed photo albums to find, we've, I've taken little pictures of and put them into a little presentation so we can, we can see them. Uh, I am trying to talk and do something at the same time. So forgive me while I do that. I'm sharing my screen. Uh, that's what I'm doing. Da, 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 da. Here we go. So hopefully you can now see a few slides. So, um, Let's just take you back, everybody, while you perhaps sip the first wine, to 2001. So this is now 20 years ago. Um, I was working for Sainsbury's at the time, and I had been... So I previously, in my earlier life, I'd worked as a winemaker for about three years. Really loved it, but never had the confidence to sort of make, say, a winemaker. I was an assistant winemaker or a cellar rat. I never had sole charge of a wine. And um, I always thought one day I would like to make my own, but didn't really quite know where to start. So I then went to get a commercial career, worked as a supermarket buyer for Sainsbury's and then uh, Safeway and then Sainsbury's. And it was while I was working for Sainsbury's that I was traveling around the south of France. And I went to a little town called Coucignon, which is a spectacularly pretty little town in the, in the Courbier, with a chap called Charlie Sichel of the Sichel family in Bordeaux, who had, they had a family domain there. And I just fell in love with the region. And as you drive over the, the, um, the hill from Coucignon, up across the pass and then you go down into the Roussillon region, it's the boundary between the Corbier and the Roussillon, you just see this utterly spectacular view. And I think at that point, I kind of fell in love with it and thought, uh, I need to come back here, this is, this is the place. And I did come back on subsequent trips as a buyer and then persuaded Amanda and Sam to come out for half term um, uh, in very late October, 2003, when it's freezing cold. And that's really where our story started because that's where we met um, a couple of our collaborators and we'll talk about them in a minute, but um, this is quite relevant to how, how these wines all taste. So uh, my friend Richard um, and his friend Mark at the time, they were working together to make wine and we really enjoyed talking to them, loved the wine that they were making. And we said, look, if you see a vineyard for sale, just give us a call and I'll pop out and have a look. So um, January that year, I got a call saying, I think we found a vineyard, do you want to come? So I, I jumped on the plane and went to have a look at it. Um, and I think actually, just before we do that, the picture that I've got uh, here is, I think, the very first digitised photograph that I could find of us in the area. And this is our son, Sam, aged five or six. 
um, standing in the car looking at the, uh, the sunroof. Um, probably not entirely to be approved of these days, you should have been wearing a seatbelt, but quite nice on those country back roads when the sun's shining to drive around looking, looking out the sunroof. And um, this was one of our early holidays there. Um, but yes, the, this is where I was standing in February, uh, looking at these vines going, well, shall I buy it or not? And rather foolishly, without much of a plan, I decided that, yes, I would, we would buy it. Um, so that was, that was how it all started. Now, for the next few years, um, yeah, this is the plot here. It's now, it's now actually 100 years old, we think. Um, and I think many of you have seen this slide before, so I'm not going to dwell on it. But uh, if you look at Google Earth, you can see the size and shape of it. But this, this plot here is about a hectare and a half of very, very old Grenache vines. Um, so we bought it rather romantically without much of an idea. And over the following couple of years, so you must remember, I was still working for um, Sainsbury's. And actually, 2005, I moved to Waitrose. Um, Full-time job, looking after the whole wine range and the whole wine team. Quite hard to get out to France frequently. So um, had to make a lot of short trips. And I was just thinking about this, Amanda. You know, we had family holidays. We'd go somewhere nice and warm for, periodically. We didn't very often holiday out in France. So I would often sneak out for a weekend or tack a few days onto the beginning or the end of a wine buying trip and just go and see Richard. And he taught me quite a lot. And we, we looked around the, the vineyard and we, we learned, I learned a bit about pruning and how to identify Grenache and Carignan. And it was sort of, I, I would sleep on Richard's floor, he had a baby, and it was very much the early days, uh, very lo-fi, and, um, and uh, yes, I mean, it's actually not changed very much, <laughs> let's say. Um, one of the people we went to see at the time was this lovely chap, Gerard Gobi, who's one of the uh, leading producers in the area, and he was uh, there with his horse when Sam and I and Amanda came to, to see him. So that was a kind of period of, of learning. Um, we then decided that 2004, we bought this plot. We gave all our grapes to Richard, so that was Richard you saw before in the previous slide. Um, and for 2004, 2005, 2006, he took all of our grapes and he put them into his wine. Um, that was the deal. He farmed our grapes, looked after them. And um, we decided in 2006 that they said to Richard, could we possibly beg a little bit of wine that's had, that, from the barrels that have our grapes in them? We reckon this wine was about 30 or 40% domain of the B grapes. And we bottled up uh, a few hundred bottles by hand. And this is with our lovely friend, Mark Barrio. <laughs> In this little cellar. This is a very typical sort of old fashioned cellar under the house, kind of Maury house. Um, and some of you, I think, will probably uh, have bought some of this 2004, which is kind of prototype vintage um, to show you what the main thing would eventually taste like when it was properly released. So that was our 2014 uh, vintage, oh. uh, four vintage. And literally after having filled the last bottle and put a cork in it, we walked down to the cafe, here is Sam modeling the, the bottles, a bit like the uh, lovely Henri Cartier-Bresson photo, it's one of my favorite pictures. Uh, probably not very politically correct these days, I may suggest young, young children and alcohol. But uh, <laughs> we may start to sound down a slippery slope rather early. But we went off to the cafe, we then ordered some steak, and then we pulled the cork back out again, literally half an hour after we put it in, poured out a couple of glasses and sat there eating our steak with Richard and uh, in, the, in the Maury sunshine in January, um, thinking what a delicious wine it was and how really well it went with steak and feeling a lovely feeling of, uh, of pleasure that our little gambit seemed to have, have uh, gone in the right direction. We had a lovely wine to, to, to drink. So um, next stop is um, having talked quite a bit with Giles and Philippe, are two lovely friends of mine, um, Philippe was intrigued, I think, and Philippe, you may have to tell us a bit about why it was that you thought that this is a good idea. It certainly wasn't a very good investment. <laughs> Philippe has been the most kind and benevolent supporter. First of all, he's, he's French and he's got an incredibly good legal brain and a financial brain. Um, he was very good. He, he said, look, if we're going to go into business, we need to set up a proper company and we need to have it all well, well done. So he hired a good lawyer, we set up the company business. And he gathers a bank account in France, did all the kind of stuff I was going to find it really hard to do. Um, and he also agreed to fund the first two or three years of producing wine before any, uh, any wine was sold, which I don't think he realised quite what that would add up to in the end. But um, he very kindly uh, wrote a couple of checks. We bought a couple more blocks. So the next step was we need a little bit more volume to go and uh, make some more wine. So let's go and buy a couple of blocks. We, we all had a lovely holiday out there in the summer of 2006. Giles, do you remember this? Um, in a very down market sheet in the Corbière. Um, Still recovering. <laughs> it very much wasn't 
a kind of standard of accommodation that I think Giles and Philippe are, are used to, but they bravely <laughs> put a brave face in it. They realised this was a budget operation uh, and there wasn't going to be a, a five-star hotel anywhere nearby. Um, so this is where we stayed and we had a, a lovely week um, and resolved to buy a couple of blocks. So uh, later that year in the winter, we met, I met, actually I think Philippe came out as well. We mm -hmm. met um, Mr. Kehol, who had about six different vineyards to look at and a, a garage he was very keen for us to buy and he wanted us to buy a wine domain of 10 or, or 12 hectares um, and we looked uh, carefully and we looked at these vineyards and we looked at the garage and we were tempted but we just thought actually this is too much of a I'm, I'm working full-time didn't really have the opportunity to, to, to get that deeply into a, a wine project so we thought no let's just buy one block so we got one from him and one later on from another guy so we had four hectares and um, there, this, this map shows you where they are. So this is the village of Mori. Um, this is the boundary with uh, the Corbiere, and there's that little aforementioned village of Cucignol. And this drive is one of the most spectacular drives in the, in, in the area. And from here, you can see the Pyrenees stretching off into the distance to our south. So the first block we bought was this one here, the Cundoua. Mr. Kayoel's block was this one here, the Bac de Genève. And the last block we bought was that one over there, La Roque. I don't know if you can see my cursor hovering over the, vineyard, the vineyards. Um, the other two spots are uh, the winery we now make our wine and um, our house. But the, when we first started, we worked with Richard in his winery. And we're going now, as probably we start tasting the first of the wine, to look at um, some of those uh, vineyards. So this is, sorry, this is the Bac de Genève plot that we bought uh, in 2006. Um, you can see all this on the website, I think. It's a, it's a now 65-year-old uh, Grenache vineyard. Uh, and actually, I left off these, this block here and this block here, which are also part of our block. And then the La Roque plot. So we now had our uh, four hectares, and we were ready to make our own wine. So in 2007, we decided that was the next year. So we bought our plots at the end of 2006, when they'd already been harvested. Started farming in 2007. Richard and Mark looked after our grapes for us. Um, and then by the end of 2007, we were ready to make our first wine. But by which time? So uh, this is the wine you have in your glasses. It's probably, if you haven't already had a go, have a little smell. Um, it's quite venerable. And I found when I first smelled this, and um, some of you may agree, the slightly stinky smell, a slightly mm. oniony smell. I, I wasn't totally happy with it. I thought it was a bit, a bit old and uh, what you might call reductive. And maybe had a slight, um, well, I don't know completely. Um, maybe it wasn't filtered when it was bottled, but uh, it put me off somewhat. And when I've now tasted it, I actually think that that flavour isn't there. It's very nice to taste, but I know it's slightly off-putting. So for me, of all the wines in the lineup, that's the one I'm thinking this has probably gone past its best. Um, <clears throat> but we were busy thinking, you know, would we buy a winery? I, I, these are some pictures. I, I always used to take pictures of houses that were for sale because uh, always interesting to go and look around. They're quite they're quite cheap. So fifty thousand to one hundred and twenty thousand euros will buy you a reasonable house. Um, this seller was for sale. Um, you maybe can't read this, but two hundred fifty five thousand euros for a four hundred square meter cellar. Um, that was one of the things we, we actually never went to look at that one, but that was one of the pictures I took through the estate agent's window. Um, so we were building in dreams and thinking maybe one day we might have our own. <laughs> place, but we very rapidly, I think with Philippe's sensible advice, decided this was too too early and we were, we were not, not well advised to buy a winery or even indeed a house at this point. So Richard, uh, our winemaking friend, having made the first three vintages before our wines were, uh, um, we made wine for ourselves, uh, made it in a garage, but he decided he needed to move into a bigger place and he rented this building from the Mary um, it was available for an artisan, but normally that means a kind of mechanic or a woodworker or a potter, but they extended the definition of artisan to mean winemaker for Richard mm -hmm. and um, allowed him to rent it. So he moved in there and this is where our first vintage was made. Um, and here we are at vintage time, um, me, Philippe, a couple of friends of ours, uh, Andy and Julie, and uh, Sam playing the fool as those of you who know him well, certainly at that age, he played the fool most of the time. His motto was, if in doubt, muck about. Um, and here he is helping Richard take some samples. So I think we're now ready to taste this first vintage. So, um, and this is probably the time if, you're, if you've got something to chip in here, 
uh, unmute yeah. yourself and, and uh, let us know what you think. Who's sort of put off by that slightly oniony nose? Anyone prepared? It's very hard at the beginning of a wine tasting to get anyone to say anything. I'm actually going to come out of the uh, slideshow at this point. Uh, do you want to do that? Oh, there we go. Well, done, Anna. well, actually, everyone else is just looking at the screen, so I'm going to stop. Oh, go away. Justin, I think it's always interesting when we get told a wine's best to drink at this time or that time. But in well, that's a good, a good point. So it's probably worth uh, mentioning that we didn't know when we started how long our wines would last. Uh, I think we hoped they would last sort of three to five years and optimistically put kind of seven years on the drinking window. Um, but, you know, in retrospect, this wine, I think, probably should have probably been drunk by about 2017. I think we've probably got that one not too far off right. Um, I think it's actually in the, in the, in the palette, still really rich. Um, all these wines are quite big and, and there's a lot of flavour there, scary amount of flavour. Um, but I think the nose means this one's got a little bit past it. I, I'm interested because after we've tasted all of them, I'll be interested to see which are keeping the best, if that's the right word, because there's a few wine, one or two wines I've tasted in my life, very fortunate, I can't remember, not like you guys, I haven't got an encyclopedic memory, but the wine maker was often surprised by the life, it's, uh, how long it lasted and how, got, how it got better. Well, I think that is sometimes true. I think the old model that wines um, start aging, they get better and better up to a point, they reach their peak, they stay on their peak for a while and then they get worse and worse and worse, is a bit artificial. I don't think that really is actually how it happens. I think. Uh, some wines definitely do die and then the no, no bottle is good after that. But bottles vary a great deal between one bottle and the other. And I think sometimes wines surprise you long after you think they were, should have been drunk. They actually, you have a bottle and it's just delicious uh, and you're not quite sure why. Um, but for me, that's getting a little bit past it. It's probably worth also sharing the, the anecdote that when I first gave this to my mum, sort of six months after we bottled it, I uh, opened a bottle for her and she tasted it and went, oh, um, but she hated it. She was saying, she was thinking, oh, I don't really don't like this wine. It's too aggressive. It's too big. It's too chunky and tannic. And it had a flavour she didn't like. Um, and she was, she was very upset. She didn't dare tell me that she didn't really like it very much. She has subsequently come around and now rather enjoys most of our wines. She, I think, prefers the white and the pink one. Um, but yes, it's a big, heavy wine. It's very extractive. Um, Liz is asking, have we changed the style? Uh, that's a really good question, and I think it has changed, Liz, and we will, as we taste through these, maybe spot some of that change. Um, and I think there's been a bit of consciousness in changing the style, and a little bit of just uh, how we work and who we work with that has resulted in the style changing a bit too. Um, but let's move to the second wine. Um, I'm going to go back to the pickies because I think I've got a few more photos to show you. So yeah, we're now into the 2018 uh, eight. Eight harvest. I'm, I'm 10 years out. The 2008 harvest. So uh, my dad, very, very unflattering photograph of him, I'm afraid to say, and he died uh, a couple of years later. Um, but he was there picking and he cut himself, as you can see, and bled into the soil of this particular <laughs> plot. So one day there may be a cuvee sang du père, blood of the father, um, from this particular plot. But we had a lovely, lovely time. Um, he came out for a few days and we went to the castles and we did some picking. And actually uh, he stayed out for a vintage party, which we had um, a little bit later. And in fact, I think, yeah, well, here we are uh, at Richard's new winery. Um, I'm tipping grapes in. Uh, Amanda's taking the photograph, I think. Um, a couple of Richard's winery workers. This is Carrie who actually married a local vigneron. And there we are processing the grapes through the destemmer. Um, here's Amanda modeling a white and a pink, uh, white and a black bunch of grapes. Um, and here is the aforementioned vintage party. So this is where it actually really felt like we we arrived and we'd you know prop, we were proper winemakers now. We had this is our second vintage. We rented a lovely sheet in the area. Um, we invited a bunch of people. I think there were sixty people there. Uh, lots of winemaking friends. Quite a few local French. Uh, quite a few English. Just a, a couple of journalists. There's a few fellow winemakers. Um, this chap here, Jean Pla, actually, he's probably the one who's responsible for, he sold us the, he was the kind of broker who, who found us the first vineyard and in fact the next two vineyards. Um, and he, he got the local mayor to come along and quite a few dignitaries. 
um, we financed the purchase of a, a, a wild boar and a, a lamb, a stuffed lamb that was roasted on a spit called a mishui, which is a kind of North African roast, roast lamb recipe with stuffed with couscous and apricots and various other things. And we had a jolly old time. Everyone brought bottles um, and it was a very, a very fine evening. And it felt like, you know, we landed, we'd actually um, started something proper now rather than just a, a, a hobby. Um, and then from that vintage, two years later, this wine arose. So have a little smell of the 2008. What do you think of that? Mm. So this was, so when we did our, our sums, Philippe, I don't know if you remember, but we were thinking about 15 hectolitres per hectare, which is the, the yield, which would have given us about 7,000 bottles, something of that order. In the first vintage, we got uh, 3,000 bottles only. Mm -hmm. Very, very bad yield. And we were rather worried about the finances, but we thought maybe we were going to have sales wine a little bit more expensively than we had planned. 2008 came along. In retrospect, this is an amazingly good yield. But at the time, we thought, OK, better, but it's not quite up to the business plan. But 5,100 bottles. Um, I think this is smelling pretty good. It's got a tiny whiff of the same smell that the first one has, but much more imbalanced, much more... Um, I got some sort of church incense and some rather non-fruit related smells here. Uh, so there's kind of walnut and um, fig and dried fruit. And I think it's a very interesting smells going on. Um, going on to the palate, let's have a taste. Oh, it's a mighty big wine. It's also quite acidic. It always has been an acidic vintage, the 2008, and quite tannic. So back in the early days, first of all, there were probably Richard was uh, in charge, really. I, I, working full time, wasn't spending the vintage out there. I'd pop out for a week or two or a weekend and another weekend um, to advise and uh, chip in and get in the way, really. Um, Richard was trying to make the wine that we wanted, but basically we were trusting him and his knowledge and skill. He rather favoured big ripe styles. And it's probably fair to say that although all the wines pretty much say 15, quite a few of them are a bit over 15. Um, as long as they're not more than 15.49, you can still label them as 15. I do know that some wines in the past have been higher than that. I'm not saying that they were definitely our wines, but um, there was one wine that we proudly bore a 15% alcohol label, apparently it was 17 and a half. Aye, aye, aye. <laughs> Not made by Richard, but it was actually the wine that we tasted that got us so excited about the area in the first place. Because when you really overripen grapes, you get these incredibly intense flavours. And I'm a big sucker for big, intense flavours. Um, I've slightly changed my tune now, and I'd be interested to know what you guys think. But this is a big wine. So 15, I actually haven't measured it, but it may be 15 plus on the, um, uh, in the bottle. Uh, quite tannic, quite acidic, but loads there still all this time ahead, it's still got loads of fruit, loads of guts. Um, the fruit flavour is becoming a bit more dried fruit, a bit more mature, a bit nuttier. So I wouldn't keep this 10 more years, but I think if you've got a few bottles left, don't hurry to drink them up. I think it's tasting pretty good. Any other thoughts on the 2008? Yeah, you have to unmute first. Uh, always a good idea if you've got to have something to say. Anyone? Justin, are they, are they going up in value, the 2008? Well, the value is a very interesting um, concept, isn't it, Peter? What, what is I, I have I found one in my cellar today, so just wondering whether it's worth selling back to you. <laughs> Do you know what? Actually, not entirely joking. 2009 and 2010, I would buy back because I don't have any and would like some. So even though I've just sold all of you some, well, many of you some, um, yeah, I could do with six bottles back in the cellar if anyone's got some 2009 uh, or 2010 so that is an offer um, we released these wines um, pretty much 15 quid when we started and then it went to kind of is it 200 for 12 which is 16.67 the bottle um, and then the price the price sort of crept up as we realized our yields were really catastrophically low and then they took a real jump when we had to start charging VAT because right in the early days we were too small to charge VAT um, suddenly then effectively the price went from 20 to 25 pounds a bottle and has stayed there ever since. I'm sort of proud to be able to say for various reasons, in spite of terrible currency and various other uh, hiked up costs. I think at 25 pounds, we should be able to keep making this wine if we can keep the yields at a reasonable level um, uh, 
profitably enough to, to, to survive and thrive. Um, but yes, the early days were released a bit lower. And, and I've had a habit of putting the prices up as the wines age because they get fewer bottles left. We've stored them for these wines 10 years. It's not inexpensive to store a bottle of wine for a year in a, in a commercial warehouse. So I've got to reflect that extra finance cost. Um, and I think, you know, I think they're worth it. I think uh, they're now 30, all the older wines are 30 pounds. We released them at 25 pounds. And after three or four years, we put them up to 30 to sort of reflect the, the age and the cost of storage. Um, whether there's a secondary market, I've never seen a bottle of Domain of the Bee sold at an auction house. I have sold ones at dinners for charity auctions for ridiculously large sums of money. Uh, I think some Lejeuneux fetched about 80 quid a bottle at the charity auction, which was pretty exciting. Uh, yeah, we sold one at the Australian Bushfires auction, it was 150 quid for a bottle of Lejeuneux. So yes, people will pay silly money when it's a charity, but I think, yeah, I think these wines hold up and a very good value compared to old Chateauneuf de Paps or old saint uh, of a similar age. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, Peter. Anyway, I'm, I'm very happy with this 2008. I think it's a lovely wine. I've always loved it. It was always, of the first five or six vintages, it was always my favorite. Um, actually, having tasted them again, I think the 9, 10, 11 are tasting pretty amazing and, and 12 in its way. Um, so let's move on. Uh, I can't actually see the time. Let me do this. Where, where, are we, where are we at with the time? Uh, we're yeah, halfway through, so we need to crack on. Um, let's have a look. Don't about the time. <laughs> so um, on to next move. So the next key step between these two wines made in that um, building you just saw and the nine. Um, oh, yeah, the next thing that happened in our lives was Otto was born. Uh, here are some little pictures of baby Otto. He's the best dog ever. <laughs> he, he is a very good dog. We, he was very, he, I was very pleased to meet him at your last tasting. Well, he's a very friendly dog and will definitely hang around wherever anyone is standing with food, just in case someone drops something. Uh, he's now 11 and a half. Um, here he was aged, I don't know, six or seven weeks just before we took him on. Um, and yes, a big move in our lives. So uh, I thought I'd just put the slide in. As I was picking, going through my photographs, I came across that one. I thought we couldn't not. Talk about Otto. But in 2009, the very smart, um, no, we can't see Otto, the very smart D66 winery had been built. Now, this was built by a chap called Dave Finney, who is a Californian um, with an amazing winemaking reputation, who made a wine in the States called The Prisoner. I don't know if anyone's, has anyone tasted The Prisoner knowingly? It's about 35 or 40 quid a bottle. Um, and uh, Pretty exciting wine, but it got such a reputation that he, he sold the brand for a very large amount of money and decided that he, he'd been to the Roussillon, thought it was stunning, thought the quality of the wine was amazing. The land was so cheap compared to California. He couldn't resist coming to this area, buying about 100 hectares and building a brand new winery, which is about 3 million euros worth of, um, of money. Oops. Well, yeah, you saw the winery there. In fact, can I go back? I can go back. Ah, clever wife was master of technology. Um, so here we have all the equipment you might ever need. Um, at the time of harvest, it was all finished except the facing. So this has just been covered in granite, uh, or rather slate um, facing tiles, but everything inside was working perfectly. So here you have a kind of a very well equipped modern winery with very good stainless steel tanks, big wide mouthed uh, necks for chucking the grapes in, a press for pressing the grapes, a pneumatic press, or rather sort of a, um, a pneumatic basket press. This is the the line that you put the grapes down. So you, you tip them in here, they go up a conveyor, they get destemmed, And then this, this table here is a, a mechanical sorting table that basically uh, vibrates and drops leaves and twigs and uh, dried grapes and underripe grapes out. And then as they fall off the edge, it blows away the ones that are no good, dropping all the perfect grapes into the right place. And I'd be quite interested to know if you think there's a change in the style because we're suddenly using this very elaborate equipment to make the it selects out about 5% of the grapes that aren't uh, quite perfect. So you get a selection of absolutely perfectly ripe grapes. That's the theory. Um, so so should we be let's move on to, the, to tasting the 2009. Um, back to a more standard yield of about 4,000 4, bottles, which was our average for the first few years. Um, this is where I have zero bottles left in stock. And for me, on the nose, you have a lot of the characteristics of the 2008, but you don't seem to have that slightly oniony character, which I don't know where it came from. Um, it's a very pure, clean, kind of fruit-driven nose. 
Um, it's got sort of notes of like cherry, kirsch. Um, uh, it's quite spirity on the nose, but it's got this lovely, lush, rich, uh, ripe fruit flavour, which I'm, I'm a big fan of. And then hmm, I brought my spittoon up, but I didn't spit anything out of it, so not that I'm swallowing that one. Um, <laughs> it's still a pretty alcoholic wine. The tannin is still quite strong. It's perhaps not quite as acidic as the eight, as 2008, which makes it a bit easier and a bit rounder, but it's still like a full 15% alcohol. Um, and I think, you know, really quite impressive, rich, modern, well-made wine in, in a very ripe style. Justin, uh, I, I was just going to say, this one to me tastes quite a bit more polished, but I think it also might be because you said that Dave Finney was an American and I'm thinking of Napa Valley wines. So um, it could also be that sort of combination of things happening, but definitely has a more polished, glossy feel than the first two. Yes, Fleur, I've written polished down in my tasting notes. Amanda Witness, I've written. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's, it's got this sort of rounded, um, burnished feel about it, like it's, it's got the edges knocked off it. Um, and I think Dave's winemaking philosophy is definitely you know, from the new world, very ripe grapes, uh, really soft tannins. Um, he does, so one of the key winemaking techniques that he set his cellar up to enable was a cold maceration before fermentation. So you chuck your grapes into those um, wide mouthed vats. And in our case, because our vineyards are so small, we were barely able to cover the bottom of some of the vats. I mean, they weren't very, we used the smallest vats. I mean, the biggest vineyard would get to the third of the way up the vat. Um, so we actually bought our own little tank so that we could have the tank uh, full of our carignan. And then we did most of our Grenache in barrels. Um, but he would, he would have the equipment there to cool the, the grapes down very very cold and then to cold macerate for a long time and really Richard was very keen and Dave on, on extracting as much flavour out of the grapes as you could before the fermentation started which means that the tannins that extract are not so rough uh, you get less um, aggressive green tannin and more uh, fruit and more weight and more flavour um, and so yes I think there's something of that Californian influence in the way the winery is set up and I really love the wines when they're young, and I, I suppose I'm. If I find them, if I have a criticism, it's they're a little bit one-dimensional. It's a bit less complexity, perhaps. It's like all concentration and power without uh, um, some of the fragrant herbal uh, subtleties. I think you can get from from wines that are slightly less ripe. And obviously, at the time, I was not really steering the style towards my personal preference because I was going out, you know, for a weekend if lucky. Over, over harvest to sort of watch what was going on rather than to really direct it. Um, and the last few years I've been much more involved. So if you like the wines more, then great, thank you very much. But if you like them less, it's my fault uh, because, well, we moved, so we moved cellar, which is part of the story, but also partly we've changed the style of it. Um, and a little bit more towards the style, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm more keen on drinking. So I, I find these wines amazingly impressive and you can have a couple of glasses. But I have to confess to having had uh, a few headaches in the morning after drinking a bottle of our wine. You definitely know you've drunk a bottle of wine when, when you had a bottle of the early domain of the B wines. Um, but yeah, I think the nine's tasting really, really spot on at the moment. I think it's got a little life in it yet. No hurry to drink it up if you've got some. Um, interested to know whether you think it's developing more interest. Some of you followed these wines for a few years. Uh, do you think it's getting more interesting as it gets older? Or, or you know, would you have preferred it five years ago? Or will you be keeping yours? Any any thoughts? Justin, hi, Justin, it's Bev. Um, I, <laughs> hi, I, I was just thinking how I'm just comparing these two, and I haven't been following you know their evolution, and I don't know when you said it's like I, I like them both, but you said the 2009 is like no rough edges, but I don't know if the 2008 has the edges that I like, but I just I don't know if it's just the acidity because it's a high higher acid vintage. But I just think that 2008 is aging so well and it's evolving really well in the glass even. Well, Whereas the 2009, I would, I would drink it now and I'm not sure that it's going to go anywhere more interesting than exactly where it is. But the 2008 is still really, um, it's really, really interesting, I think, to drink the 2008. I don't know, what, what's, what's your kind of feeling about that? I kind of, I, I kind of let the cat out of the bag early on when I said the 2008 was my favourite vintage of the first five. Um, 
five or four or five, um, because of that acidity. And there's something about the, the tannin, which is savory and chewy and interesting, whereas the more polished nine and 10, perhaps, don't have that. And, and they're more impressive, perhaps, and more, they were very impressive when young. Um, and I think it's a stylistic thing rather than a factual, you know, it's better or worse. Um, you know, we've entered our wines into various competitions. Some vintages have done pretty well, some a bit less well. It depends on the competition, it's a bit of luck. Some people just fall in love with the wine and, and rave about it. And every time I sh I've learned not when people say which is your favorite vintage to sort of to be too articulate about it, because it's a bit like saying which is your favorite child. Uh, all, all of them show something at some point, and everyone sees everyone has a favorite child. <laughs> well, we do, but we've only got one, so uh, I'm actually toss up between the child and the dog sometimes. <laughs> but I think it's probably time to move on to number uh, four, 2010 vintage. Um, while I was going through the photographs, I realised that there weren't quite as many photographs of nine, uh, 2010 and 2011, because I think I was travelling a lot, and I had a few Master of Wine trips to go on, and I think I, I, think I made it out in 2010. Um, I know there was an end of harvest party because I got photographs of that. It's a lovely blurry one here. Uh, these are normally instigated by me because I, I don't know if somehow I wanted to see everyone. When I was out there for a weekend, I wanted to see everyone who I wanted to see. Uh, and I'd try and go out towards the end of vintage where I could taste everything. And it seemed like a good time just to send an invitation around saying, come to a party. And frequently we'd do this stuff. Uh, the third or fourth one, we asked people to pay 20 euros each to come along. I think this one was the first that we asked people to pay just to cover the food cost. Because otherwise I was, you know, well, me or Philippe, me and Philippe were out, you know, a grand or two out of pocket for, for, for throwing these parties, which were great fun, but, um, uh, you know, really intended to gather a few people together. I, th this, I think this one we asked everyone to pay 20 euros and it kind of it kind of covered the costs. And we had another spit roast lamb and uh, found someone cellar in which to have it. And it was a bring a bottle party with lots of winemakers. Um, very good fun. Um, you need to share your screen, Justin, again. Oh, yes, really sorry. Good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's the alcohol. I nearly, I nearly pressed the big red end button, so uh, be grateful that I need to make this. Yes, I should just let Amanda do this. She's been presenting all day, Amanda. She had just had a three hour presentation. So, share screen. Um, I'm sharing the screen, but I need to go back to here. And I need to go back. So what I was talking about with the party and the spit roast uh, lamb, I think you can now see on the screen. Am I right? Good. Yeah. Lots of nods. So yeah, lots of blurred drunken people at a party uh, and a lovely spit roast lamb. It is just a really good way to cook lamb, by the way. So uh, I've never been able to replicate it in England. They get a car battery and uh, I have a little rotating spit and they plug the car battery in and it just turns the lamb steadily while it's, while it's cooking. And they just use a, a spade to move the coals underneath or they can light some more somewhere else and then when they're nicely burning they bring them and put them underneath. Uh, but, but each winemaker brings along three or four bottles of their uh, own wine. Their own wine, there's a lot of wine, so yeah. Wine. You have to be careful about driving home. Um, also on this trip I actually hosted a bunch of wine bloggers and uh, communicators. Um, in the early days of blogging it was quite exciting times and we went to visit a few local producers and so one of them that we went to see was this guy Hervé Bizoy. And I mentioned him because he is the producer of, I think, still the Roussillon's most expensive uh, wine, which is this one, uh, La Petite Siberie, which means Little Siberia, because there's a, a, a plot of vines he's got, which has got an entirely white, um, chalky subsoil. So when you look at it from a distance, it looks like it's got snow on it. Um, and it produces a very, very fine uh, Grenache-based red. I don't, I don't know if it's 100% Grenache or if it's a field blend, um, but it's about 200 euros a bottle. And it's a pretty impressive wine, but it's not, you know, you go, well, not that much better than a 30 or 40 pound bottle, but it's definitely just finer, more elegant. It's got a precision and a, and a delicacy. And it's, it's not necessarily more is more. It's actually almost less is more. La Petite Burie. It's a big wine, but it's not huge. Um, and we went to see him and he's a very inspiring, interesting guy. Uh, and I tasted his wine a couple of times before. And I started to think, you know, could we, could we even think that one of our barrels might taste as good as that? Can we sell a wine for 200 euros? Um, we eventually concluded that would be a bit rich financially, but we maybe could sell uh, a barrel for a bit more. And actually, it was my friend Patrick. Who Who's here? Is here. Where is Patrick? No, I don't know. Patrick, where? I saw him join. I'm here. I'm here. 
Ah, Patrick, no, Patrick, not you, Patrick, another Patrick. <laughs> uh, maybe we haven't Patrick, seen I still think they should put the prices up. Well, <laughs> good, okay, good advice. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, my friend Patrick Porritt came out, and actually he went to visit Richard when we weren't there and tasted through the barrels. And he went, there's one or two barrels you've got there that are really, really good. He said, I think it just tasted pretty seabury. And he said, you know, you're not far away from that in quality. You should be doing something more with this. So next time we went out, we bottled it um, by hand. And here we go, bottling Le Genou. So this is a 2009 barrel bottled in 2011 with a bunch of friends. Uh, literally, this is very artisanal, but we literally stuck a siphon hose in and had these little uh, filler caps that theoretically stop when it reaches 750 mils. Well, you can see by the mess that it didn't always stop on time. Uh, and there was a bit of adjusting needing to be done uh, between one bottle and another to get the levels right. Then we drove the corks in by hand, stuck them in a cage and waited for the labels to be printed. Uh, and then printed the labels, stuck beeswax on the nets and had 267 bottles of Le Genou, which is very exciting. And we kind of gave away a few and we sold them to friends and, and, and uh, early customers and it was really popular um and you know we've been persuaded to do it again because at 35 pounds a bottle i think was the release price compared to i think we were probably now around 20 for the main of the b um it was quite a bit more expensive but it came from this really low yielding vineyard that was so uh, expensive to farm for the number of bottles we got we thought there's no way we can justify doing it unless we charge a bit more so we we did and it's actually we're so pleased that we started doing legend because it's absolutely stellar wine that's been getting really good ratings it's a lighter style it's a uh, softer easier going but with a sort of delicacy and complexity that i think um, people are really beginning to enjoy and i think the 19 Genie, which is coming out is a, is a really nice very light style I'm, I'm rather pleased with it and i hope you will be too when you get to taste it um so this is 2011 and there we were um bottling that but a little bit later in the vintage we picked these grapes from our fifth wine. So now time to have a little smell and taste of this one. We're going to do the 2010, Justin. Oh, sorry, yes. Amanda, yeah. she's ahead of me. Let's do the 2010, <laughs> as would be traditional. Um, sorry about that, 2010. I love you, Billy. Okay. Right, for me, much of the polish and ripeness of the nine but perhaps a little bit more edge, a little bit more grip to it, a bit more savoury. Um, when I was tasting through before, it was, I think, my second highest scored wine. I was really keen on the 2010. It's a brilliant vintage across almost all of France. It's one of those rare vintages where you can go to Burgundy, you can go to Bordeaux, you can go to the Rhone, you can go almost anywhere in France. 2010 was a really good vintage. In some cases, exceptional. In some cases, just really good. Mm. And... I think around us, um, nine was pretty good too, but I think 2010 was, was... Was was that just the weather that year, J Justin, that made everyone... It's, yes, it was a kind of fairly ideal vintage. It, it, it was it was hot, um, but not, there were no obvious heat waves. Um, there was no inclement weather that caused enormous problems. I mean, probably one or two regions might have had frosts or a few early season problems and had lower yields. Um, it's very hard to say what it is about a vintage that uh, makes it amazing. Um, and it's quite rare for all of France to have good conditions. You sometimes get an amazing vintage in Bordeaux and a terrible vintage in the Rhone or, or the other way around. But is this, still your, is this still your highest yielding year? Out of these five it is, but generally. Highest, highest yielding? Mm. Yeah. No, no, this was a moderate, just under 4,000 bottle yield. From oh yeah, I moved on to 11 by mistake. Yeah, sorry, I was, uh, yeah, I showed the slide for 11, but yeah, this was a moderate yield. And um, I mean, these yields are still tiny. They're really appallingly low. We're still under 10 hectares a hectare, I think, at this level. Um, when our, our plan was for 15. Um, but yes, I'm, I'm pretty pleased. I think it's tasting really good. Um, it, it's showing age and maturity but it's still got bright fruit. Um, I think it's got tannin, it's got some fresh acid, I think it'll age well. I do have a question about whether the, with the age, you will get more complexity, more positive uh, extra flavors developing. P people in the wine talk about primary, secondary, and tertiary characteristics. Primary are just the fruit flavors that come from the fruit. So in the first two or three years of a wine's existence, you, you mostly have those primary fruit flavors. And then secondary flavors are, are flavors that, um, develop over a, a little time and also things like oak influence and lees and 
um, other, other winemaking effects can modify those primary fruits to give you some other flavors. And then tertiary characteristics sometimes take a while in the bottle to develop. Um, and it requires molecules in the wine to kind of polymerize or react or change in some way and develop into the kind of smells of truffle and smells of the, what the French call sous-bois, which means the um, undergrowth, sort of the, the leaf mold you get in a wood that's got that kind of um, rather sometimes lovely sort of smell of mushrooms and, uh, and uh, kind of aged leaves. Uh, so for me, I'm, I've, my question is, will these wines develop some more interesting secondary or tertiary aromas as, as, as they get old still? And the answer is I'm not completely sure. I think these are lovely now. Bev, what do you think? You, you chipped in earlier on. Bev, Bev is a fellow master of wine, so I'm, I'm asking her opinion because I really want to know. Right. Uh, what do I think about what in particular? About the 2010 and whether whether the, you said the nine may, may not uh, age so interestingly as the eight has done. What do you think about the 10? I think the 10 is uh, superior to the nine. And um, I, my first thought with the 10 was, my first thought with the nine was that it was kind of really ripe. And I mean, actually the nine and the 10, uh, I don't know how they were in your part of the world, the nine, the 09, but it reminded me of uh, what you think when you when you taste Bordeaux, 09 and 010, because the 09, you have that kind of generosity and ripeness. Yep. And 010, like you said, you've got that bit of edge, but it's like really glossy. And I think it's actually gorgeous wine, actually. Really lovely. No, that's great to hear. Um, your camera's pointing at an empty glass at the moment. <laughs> oh, is it? I can't, I can't I see. Know. We can't see the camera. I can't see, we can't see our own camera. Oh, right, no, no, fair enough. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> An empty yeah. glass. Is it, is it this one yeah. here? Yes, that's, this that's is the ten. <laughs> You're all looking at the slide still. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll um, I'll, I'll, let's let's move on to the eleven because I'm conscious of time, um, and then we'll have a good chat about the eleven when we get on to that. Has anyone got any other comments about the ten before we move on? Mm. No, okay. everyone's on mute. So if they're trying to talk, they're not uh, getting through. But uh, let's move on. Taste the eleven which uh, we've got kind of 10, 12, 15 minutes left. So um, I'm, I'm obviously, as always, delighted to keep talking way beyond uh, eight o'clock. Some of you might have suppers to go to. So we will sort of allow you to drift off at that point and we'll, we'll hang around if you want to hang around and ask some more questions. So um, I think, yeah, move, move on to the next slide. Uh, we're bottling, we've done that already. Um, this is the 11, here we go. So this is, um, the biggest vintage we made in total. Um, don't forget, we as well as the 5,200 bottles we made of this, we also made about 1,000 bottles of Le Genou. So in total, the first vintage we made of Le Genou was nine, and we made one barrel, then we made two barrels of 10, and this time we made, I think, um, uh, about 750 litres, so decent amount. And so therefore, this vintage would have yielded 6,500 bottles, probably, if we'd made it all into one wine. So it was the biggest year by, by a long time. We nearly got to 15 hectares a hectare, which is the, the business plan prerequisite amount. But people often are tempted to imagine that small yield means low yield, low yield means good. And that's often, there is a correlation, the lower yields, lowly yielding vineyards often give better quality fruit. But actually I found from uh, going through the, our range of wines, the best years have been the biggest. So 2008 was a big year, 2011 was a big year, 2015 was moderately good, uh, 2017 was a really good year. Um, so, you know, we definitely fairly much well, when, thing, when things ripen well, when you've got a good, a good crop and you've got vines capable of ripening, as long as something doesn't go wrong at vintage time and you have to pick early, you can end up with a lovely crop of lovely ripe fruit and, and plenty of grapes. So um, it means a healthy vine and it means a, a balanced vine. Uh, and with our yields, which are really low anyway, I think. Justin, yields. what yeah. distinguishes that it becomes Genou? How's the decision made? Well, it's a very good question. Oh, Chris George is joining us. Um, uh, so, good, very good question, David. So, Le Genou is um, from one of our uh, vineyard blocks. It's the oldest block, and it's the block with. Um, it's mostly Grenache, but it's got lots of other grapes mixed in the same plot. Um, and it was in, in doing barrel tastings that every time... from disc not ejected properly. <laughs> Hello, Chris. Have you joined us? Sorry about that. I'll turn my um, uh, <laughs> thing off. <laughs> That's great. I love your automated voice. Doesn't know how to pronounce properly. Properly. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Great, lovely to lovely you could join us. And sorry you missed out the earlier stuff. We're on to the 2011 vintage, and um, David's just asked about Les Genoux. So yeah, Les Genoux is just one vineyard, and it's usually the best barrel or the best two or sometimes three barrels from that vineyard. Um, it's a mixed the vineyard with some white and pink grapes mixed in, so the colour is always a bit paler. The yield's really low, so it's got a sort of elegance and a, and a subtlety that's um, the sort of carrying your heavy domain of the B wine uh, perhaps sometimes doesn't have. I mean, as you know, I'm a fan of all of it, but I treat myself to Le Genoux. Le well, I've obviously had five glasses of wine. Le Genoux after a bit, uh, and it's a really brilliant wine. Well, that's really nice. I know that's not, I know that's not an, a wine person's term, but I know what I like. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I've got some sort of worrying news, which is that vineyard is really struggling with um, health issues. It's very old. And some of the vines are struggling, and there's a notifiable uh, disease called Flavocense Dore, which is getting closer. We think we have some vines in that vineyard that have, have got it, which means we need to rip them out and rip all the vines around them out. So we're going to do some remedial ripping out this year. Um, we might lose, I don't know, two or three hundred vines that are kind of close together, and hopefully that will stop it spreading, uh, and we'll carry on being able to make it for a while. But in the... I shouldn't say this, but I still think it's underpriced, so uh, hopefully you can make money out of it. Well, I, I haven't yet decided on the pricing for the 2019, um, and it, I'm going to taste it when it's bottled and just form a final view. I mean, it's 40 quid at the moment, we might go to 45. We're not going to go stupidly high. I mean, I, I don't really believe in scaring off your market by going to you know, stupid prices. You'll attract a new market of very, very rich people, but you'll lose all your old supporters and people who you know loyally love the wine so i think it, it, you lose it, wines it's an economics it's a it's a it's an equation isn't it you've got to make money otherwise there won't be any 220 or 221 yes the, there's the, that's a very good point yes you do have to make money and, and some people in the wine business do take piss and charge ridiculous prices uh, which i don't really approve of um well your wine is so amazingly good and it's, it's one of those that every single time we bring them somewhere everyone always wants to know where they're from and how because they're so incredible and they're so good and it's just the fact that you're a small producer and we'd like to support you so i'd happily pay more okay <laughs> if that means you're around i'll happily pay more i can see a few grimaces going around also <laughs> on other in other screens okay please don't charge more um well thank you <laughs> no, and, you know, we, we you know we'll put the prices to where we think they deserve to be um and um yeah i mean i don't want to put the prices on because yeah. i won't be able to afford to drink them um, but I think Legend, you may go up a little bit. But yes, the uh, 11th. Justin, can I yeah. ask you a question? Please do. Uh, I don't know if you can see me or my glass or whatever. Um, there was a, at the moment that there's this, you may have heard about this. Oh, oh. yeah, there's the empty glass. Oh, it's the rock in the wrong way around. <laughs> oh, yeah, because we've got to reverse. <laughs> we've reversed the screen. There you go. How do you do that? I think that's us. Okay. <laughs> um, we've got full glasses of, uh, of your wines here. Um, no, the question was today and tomorrow, if anyone's interested, actually, there's a very interesting old vine conference going on. I don't know if you saw any of it today. And um, it's on tomorrow evening. If you just look up old vine conference, you can find it. And um, they were talking about like a new economic model for old vines, uh, but nobody actually said what it was. So I don't know if you're, if you have any ideas about a new economic model for making money out of old vines but I mean obviously the idea if people value old vines more they'd be prepared to pay more for them. I mean it's a, it's a hot topic I've been talking a lot to Sarah Abbott who's a fellow master of wine who's behind the old vine initiative and her hope is to unite excuse me to unite producers of old wine old vine wines from around the world to see if we can get some kind of um, recognized certification for vine age and start to put logos on bottles saying you know the various places that do have, I think in America, in, in, in uh, Barossa, in Australia, they've got a um, kind of four level uh, hierarchy. And I forget what they call them all, but they're kind of, um, sort of old vine, they call them survivor, centenary. There's various terms that they mean. If, to be old vine, they have to be 40. To be at the next level, they have to be 70. And then there's a, a level of over 100. And then they've got some vines that are over 120 years old in, in Australia. So your vineyard has to kind of be certified to have vines that old and then you can share this logo that, that anyone with vineyards like that can can use that try to give some value to those really old vineyards and if there was a worldwide system that everybody used then it would be easier um at the moment there's no regulation about what you can claim so Vievin in france i think 
in most places at about 25 or 30 years old, you can start saying BAV, and there's no there's no higher classification. So um, for, our, for our point of view, that's not very old at all. Um, so there's going to be a conference. Uh, is it tomorrow, Bev? Bev? It's, 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 today, it's today and tomorrow. So it was today, this morning, but it, tomorrow it's on in the evening. So I think it starts at about five, five o'clock in the evening. Right. It was really very interesting. I would, uh, and, and anyone can go and it's free and it's, um, it's really interesting. So I'd recommend it. Well, look, if you're all you know, keen fans of our wine, a lot of the secret is the age of the vineyards. I mean, I'm telling you that until we plant a new vineyard or buy a young one, in which case I'll tell you, young vines are the way to go. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> old vines are definitely part of the flavour of our wine. And, can, you put uh, a link? can you put a link or something into the chat for that? Um, yeah, I don't point. know that lady's name, sorry. Just um, Be Beverly, um, if you just search for old vine, I think if you look for old vine conference, I'll, I'll, I'll go and check. I'll find it, don't worry. That'd yeah, Old Vine Conference. If, if anyone can put a link in the chat, then that'd be, that'd be very kind. Because I, I'm, I'll, I'll have a look. I'll have to stop talking otherwise and, and, and spend five minutes looking on Google, which wouldn't be ideal. So look, we're tasting this 2011, I think. Um, 57. What, uh, what thoughts do we have about 2011? I find it extraordinarily fruity. I mean, this wine was incredibly fruity when it was young. As a juice, it was really fruity. As a wine, a young wine, it's just booming fruit. And I still find this incredible... Um, damson saturated juicy black fruit. Any any other any other thoughts? Any other notes? I put wow is my first comment. It's very Moorish. <laughs> very very Moorish. Thank you, thank you, Paul. Um, yeah, I think well, I found a, I, I wrote Chilean because there's something about the fruit in Chile that that has a sort of minty vibrancy uh, about it. Um, I sometimes talk about when I was at school. In physics classes, I used to go and buy half a pound of wine gums at, uh, at the break. And we had a double physics class. So I needed these wine gums to get through the class. And I have a habit of eating wine gums in reverse order of colour. So I start with the yellow ones and then the orange ones. And I also bought half pounds so that I could give all my friends as many wine gums as they asked for and still have a lot of wine gums <laughs> left for me. And so I'd eat all the yellow ones. And, then, and what I'd finish by doing is getting about five or six black ones and putting them into my mouth at the same time and then chewing them until I got this explosion of black wine gum flavor. So basically, this is my, has been my winemaking philosophy. And this is the wine that I think it's most resembles that. It's the sort of huge explosion of black wine gums. I can't believe the color for 10 year old wine. The, the Carignan was completely, I mean, it wasn't even purple, it was black. You couldn't see through it. It was in, incredibly intense. I think Richard had a lot of fun extracting as much colour as he could before the fermentation and this juice was just black before it started and uh yeah very impressive wine and it's still really gorgeous and incredibly young and fruity so I think this is again got, got a long time ahead of it um this is not an advert but it's the only one we have any stock realistic stock left of we have about 120 bottles left um but every time I taste it I'm I'm impressed I'm going to keep 30 or so of those bottles we'll do a dinner at some point and serve this wine um, and I'd like, to see, I'd like to keep a bit to see how it ages in, in ten, 10 years' time. I think time-wise, we're now pretty close to eight. I'm going to crack on with the 12. Um, I'm not sure there were very many other exciting slides um, to show, but let's, uh, let's see, there were maybe one or two. Um, that's 11, let's move on. So yes, uh, in 2010, I was looking through the photographs, um, early 2012, we bottled our 10s. Uh, Richard's Winery doesn't have a bottling line, so we used the mobile bottling a truck which comes along with all this kit inside it all the stuff down the middle between the tanks is brought on the back of the truck you lift it off and line it up down the winery and put the wine at one end um and the dry goods and then out come full cases of the wine at the other end so that's the mobile bottling line um let's try the next one um is there one more oh, oh. Uh, so we're now moving on to 2012 so we had to stop working with richard and the reason was that dave who owns the winery had originally built the winery for a certain capacity and he gradually built his capacity up in the first three years and come the end of the third year he realized he's going to be needing all the space in his winery for himself and didn't really have room for us and a couple of other passengers who were sort of on Richard's coattails were making our wine in the corner um, so he said look would you mind awfully seeing if you can find somewhere else to make your wine and don't worry about it I'll give you, you know, a good couple of years there's no rush but to sort of put you on notice um, and as it happened, I have a friend, John Martin Lafarge, who I'd worked with in South Africa. 
Um, and he's a very, very good and highly reputed winemaker in the region. He reasonably recently bought a, um, a winery about five miles down the road. So I just called John Mark and said, look, we're facing a situation where we may need to find somewhere else to make our wine. Are you, are you up for it? And he said, yeah, yeah, why not? So we will happily host you at uh, Chateau Saint-Laurent. Um, so in the middle of 2012, when Richard had done all the farming, by the harvest time, um, we, took, we picked the grapes and took them to Jean Marc's winery and made the wine there. Um, now, we had a pretty shockingly small harvest. Uh, so yeah, this is uh, Jean Marc's winery. This is Jean Marc here on the right. Um, he's just turned 50 now, I think. Um, from, a, from a local family, uh, his grandfather moved to the coast a while back. Uh, had a few vineyards there and he's gradually grown his his um his holdings he's got about 200 hectares now it's probably a major he's probably the major player in the region outside the cooperatives um but he bought Chateau Saint Rock which is this uh, cellar here um and we started making our wine from the grapes that Richard had farmed um but we had an appallingly small deal this is the worst yet so we made 2,000 bottles we did make 190 magnums as well so we could have made two and a half thousand bottles effectively but but lowest yield yet um and also the winery has subsequently had quite a few little refinements to um to the way we make wine there uh, this year we didn't have a great deal so without a lot of rehearsal we kind of made our wine fairly quickly we didn't have time for too much macerating um and it was a slightly difficult vintage so uh, we've got a slightly lighter style and I'd love to know what you think of it. It's not as deep in colour. It's got more perfume. And I find a bit, a bit more herbal notes, which I, I kind of like. Um, and I know a few of the fans of the Magnums have been really enjoying this in Magnum recently. I think it's a much more um, quaffable wine. I think it's easy to fit it into your life better than some of these monsters. I mean, the 11 is amazing, concentrated, impressive wine. It's quite a big wine. It kind of shouts a bit. It's about not listening to music very loud. Whereas the 2012 is a bit more delicate and sort of sits in the background better and has a, a lovely savouriness. I think it's drinking really, really nicely. And it is a slight shift in style. And if you join me for the next tasting, when we do the next six, I'd love to sort of see what you think, whether we've carried on with this 2012 style. I think we've gone a little bit richer and a bit riper in the subsequent vintages, um, particularly for 15 onwards. But uh, yeah, what do you think? Who, who, who likes the 2012 style? So we're big fans and have drunk lots of it, as you know. In fact, just took have a delivery. Have you only got there. bottles left? Um, I've got almost, what have I got? I've got, I think there's 10 or 12 bottles in the warehouse. I've got uh, uh, one full box downstairs. I've also, uh, we did a trial with this wine. I was working with a cork company at the time. We had a novel cork product. So I put aside some trial cases with the standard cork and their cork and I've still got some of those bottles left um they're in France mostly but yes there's probably 12 available on the website there's probably another 40 or so uh, I think I think you should do a charity auction for the last 12 bottles if you're happy to sell them <laughs> whereby you take 30 quid 40 quid whatever and everything above goes to a charity of your choice or something like that, if you fancy that idea well, that's a very nice thought, David. Yes. Well, um, that's a good thought. I, I don't know quite how we'd administer it, but we'll, we'll put our thinking caps on and see what we might do with that. We do um, periodically support various charities, particularly bee charities. Um, we supported the Bumblebee Conservation Trust uh, quite a bit. And um, you, you choose the charity. We'll bid for the wine. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't know how we're going to administer the bidding. We'll try and we'll talk about it and see if we can come up with a plan. Uh, any other thoughts about the, the, the 2012? I, what I'd really like to do is a little bit of a vote about who likes which vintage best. So given that we are now kind of five minutes over time, let's just give a bit of thought to who likes each which vintage best. And I'll go, go through in turn. You can only mm -hmm. choose one to vote for. Um, and yeah, just have a review, make, make your thoughts. And we'll do it by hands raised. I think we'll do it by physical hands raised so that we get to see everyone on the screen at the same time. Uh, we've got 28 participants. Still, how many is that? That's five, five, six. There are three, no There's three without screen. So you won't be able to vote, Alex, Patrick, and Chris, if you don't turn That's your screens on. Um, okay, I'm now going to ask who wants to vote for their favourite wine being 2007? Tumbleweed. 
I think I I damned it by saying it smelled of onion. I'll, I'll give it a half though. I really like it. Good. Thank you, Patrick. I just, it's not without some considerable merit, I think, but um, yeah, it's probably not everyone's favourite wine. Whose favourite wine is the 2008? Hands up, please. One, two, three, four, five, That's six. Alex. I think I can see six hands. So I'm going to mark six marks for 2008 and half a mark for 2007. It doesn't have to add up to 28 because there's lots more than, there's lots of you here. So I, I don't know what the total will be. Let's just keep counting. Um, so I'm not going to notice if you vote for more than one. Who likes 2009 best? Ooh, quite a few. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Is your hand up, Amanda? No. Nine. I think nine or ten. Ten. Good. Good score for 2009. What about 2010? One, two, three, four, five, oh. four, six, seven. I think it's seven, 2010. Who likes 2011 best? Ooh, quite a few. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Try the second screen. Yeah. I don't think they understand the rules, Justin. <laughs> well, there's a few people who might have voted more than one, but I'm, I'm yeah, we're allowing that. Um, and who thinks number 12 is the, uh, sorry, 2012 is their favorite. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. And Anthony. Seven. Oh yeah, he's there. Seven, seven, okay. Well look, that's, that's an even spread. And it's first what's, show. what's the total? What's the total? No, the, the total of the yeah, joint winners are, are, are two. 40 and a half. 40 <laughs> and a half is the total, which is actually is not bad. No, because it's a French voting system, it doesn't matter. There's 28 screens, there's a lot of you are twos. So um, that's yeah, true. we may not have counted every vote. This is not scientific, but it shows there's a reasonable spread. Everyone has some advocates except for the seven, which I damned slightly at the beginning. Um, so Justin, you didn't vote. No, you're you right. Your vote. children. I didn't vote. Uh, I'm thinking about Solomon here. I've got to come up with some sort of Solomon. I can't. I can't. Auto. 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 Eleven. I bet. I would vote. I would vote for the eight and probably the eleven. But I'm. Kind of, I'm kind of enjoying the twelve. Auto. Auto. I don't know what I would can vote. I just interrupt on the two thousand and seven? Uh, when I first tasted it, I thought, gosh, you're right. I think it's a bit on the edge. But actually, now it's had a chance to warm up and I've got used to it. It, it has a character all of its own. And there's something about those early years which are very, I don't know, raw and, and no. naive. And, and they have a, a, a charm of their own. So I don't think it's fair to compare those with the others. And I, I love it. Well, th that's a lovely thing to hear. And actually, you know, I think the experience of tasting wine and a tasting and then drinking wine are kind of two different experiences. And... I think you, you really, to say how much you enjoy wine, you have to have drunk a, a bottle. Uh, I call it the Pooh Bear test, which is when, remember Pooh takes a bottle, of, a, a pot of honey to Eeyore for his birthday. And he just thinks he should check that it's good. So he has a little taste. And, as he, um, uh, and, and as he walks a little bit further, he thinks he better just check a little bit further down to make sure it's still good. And then he better taste the honey at the bottom. By the time he gets to Eeyore's house, obviously he's drunk it all. Um, and actually, there was a very interesting debate on wine Twitter. If anyone is on Twitter and wants to expose themselves to a world they may not have followed very much, just hashtag wine Twitter will find a bunch of people who are in the wine world who talk about wine on Twitter. Um, there are all sorts of little Twitter worlds that you can get into, but we had a bit of a, a, a um, collision with music Twitter. Someone was talking about uh, how people review music, and this music review posted. Uh, actually an interview with a music reviewer and a wine guy saying, you know, wine people taste like 10 wines in a row and taste them for two minutes and spit them out and then write a note and move on and that's their review. And this music reviewer said he listens to an album like five or six times before he even starts writing anything mm. so he can sink into his head and then he starts to write and he listens to it another five or six times while he's writing thoughts about it and he lives with it for a month before he posts his review because he doesn't feel he's given it just justice. And I think with wine, it's a bit the same, although wine writers would be permanently drunk if they have to do that. <laughs> um, so hopefully we've had a chance to give these wines a bit more than just a sip and you've got a little bit left to enjoy the rest of the evening. What? Azim has commented, he's only Justin, 2007. On the 12th, you say 2022 is the range for drinking, but I assume you think it's got a few more years, yeah? I mean, drinking windows, you know, what are they for really? 
um, when people release the wine, so people always, a lot, a lot of drinkers ask when, uh, when wines are going to be uh, drunk. So people tend to post a window, but you're guessing really. Um, so you don't want people to buy your wine and not open a bottle for 10 years. So you tell people that it's really drinking well from next year or this year. I get uh, it. And then you sort of hope that it'll be good in 10 years time. So you put 10 years time. You don't really know. I think when you've had 30 or 40 years running a domain and you really do know that actually the wine's done for five or six years and then they're brilliant for five or six more and then they die, then you tell people that. But you know, we're still groping our way towards it. And I think there's merit in wines when they're really young and merit in wines when they're really old. I'll just ask you the question. Uh, you know, let's imagine you lived till your, into your 80s. Which age were you at your best? It's not a question you can answer, really. You know, you probably had a great period in your teenage years where you were really on fire then you might have gone through a bit of a dip and then uh doing really well at work thrusting young executive you know doing really well and then then you got married and had kids and moved in a different phase and then you know when you're old you've got wisdom and you don't have vigor i think wine ages a bit like that so it depends on what you enjoy and your wines will change over time and very occasionally they you know really cheap nasty wines won't last more than three or four years and then they're dead and they're not going to come back and you know you've oxidized it and but, it's finished. But, well, I have to say that there are two people on this call. One is called Philippe, but he's not the Philippe. It's Philippe Bobroff, who's going to raise his hand now and be nice to me. And his brother, Tony, who didn't know his brother, that I got them together for his, Philip's birthday celebration and they're virgins for Domain of the Bee. So I'm sure they're going to be fans in the future as ever. It's been brilliant, Justin. Thank you. Well, Dave, thank you. thank you for bringing it and, and as you have previously. And uh, is it Philippe's birthday? 69th birthday, I think. Well, I should it's be. 69th birthday, yeah. yeah. And there's also someone called John, whose birthday it is today, because Anne and Paul are sending him happy birthday wishes. All oh, right, happy that birthday. Paul with Paula Matthews. John with Paula. Ah. Well, great that you can we connect toast. over our toast. Everybody happy toast. birthday, which is whatever your favourite wine. Toast to Philippe and to John. Happy birthday. Happy birthday wishes. And um, well, let's, let's say that we've now finished our tasting. We're going to stay here if you want to hang around and talk more. Because anyone else who's got supper on, on the go? Hang it all, guys, or leave it and have a chat? Let's have a chat, too. Yeah. OK. I'm just going to send a message saying thanks. OK, we can still hear you, David. So you have a good <laughs> message. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks thanks very much, Justin. Very thanks. good. And Amanda. Thank you, Justin and, and Amanda. Thanks, brilliant as ever. We really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Amanda, he does. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful evening. Bye.